a little bit about my background. I've done about everything in security. I started, I graduated out of the Media Lab, the MIT Media Lab, uh, focused on how humans perceive technology. Uh, I was doing some crazy things with head mount displays. A friend, and my, a friend and I actually developed our own head mount display. Crazy enough, it looked just like the Apple um, glass, or the Google Glass that came out. So um, I'm trying to figure out where my friend is who worked with me on that. Um, but uh, I, I mean, I was a small time, you know, kind of kitty hacker. I had a C64 at home, poor family. So what else am I going to do but do BBS hacking in my spare time? I learned some basic, did some coding, that sort of thing, and then decided, yeah, I suck at this, so I'll fig figure something else to do. And so I went into cognitive psychology, started focusing on how humans interact with um, technology, which made it great to become a social engineer. So that was fun. And so from there, I did usability engineering for the government, doing user interface design. But then I moved into security because I was already kind of doing security, so I figured I might as well move into security. I've been doing security for about 20 years. Started on the consulting side. I actually call myself a recovering consultant. Uh, anybody a consultant in the room? Anybody who wants to be a consultant in the room? Um, <laughs> the, uh, so, um, but I did some interesting things. I worked with some big companies, worked with some big agencies, started working on really, really large, risky, security-oriented projects. I'm sure everyone's heard about DHS. Uh, at one point in time, DHS was a bunch of different little bureaus that all came together at an, by an act of Congress and didn't want to communicate with each other. I was the guy who was trying to convince all those CISOs to do so. Um, so I did some of that. And then I jumped out of consulting, became a CISO, started listening to vendors, trying to sell me $20,000 appliances. Why do security appliances always cost $20,000? I don't get it to this day. <laughs> Somehow that's the magic price point. I guess somebody paid $20,000 and they're like, oh, I got an idea. So, um, so I did that. And then I ran my own security consulting company with a friend of mine, moved from DC. Thank goodness. I don't know if anybody lives in DC or has ever lived in DC. I would never wish that on my worst enemy. Um, came up here to Boston. I started focusing on advanced research. And one of the things about advanced research, it, you know, we, we have a problem with security, right? In all of those paths, that, you know, all the path that I've taken, all the little touch points I've taken as far as security is concerned, there's one thing that has been consistent. We, users, administrators, investors, business people, executives, et cetera, et cetera, board members, we are the weakest link, right? Why have we been saying this for 20 some odd years, at least, right? I, th I only say 20 some odd years because, of course, we didn't have really the web before then, so we didn't have a lot of cause to have to talk a lot about security. But for the past 20 years, we've been talking about we are the weakest link. And the thing is, is through my entire career, I've been trying to figure out what does that mean? Not what does the statement mean, but what does it mean that we keep saying the same thing over and over and over for two decades at least? And so you st I started taking a look at the problem. Of course, cognitive psychologist, I always have to see, okay, how am I fucking things up, right? How, what, what am I just doing wrong? I'm doing something wrong. Everyone's doing something wrong. I've been saying for years everyone's doing something wrong. And I started thinking about it, and I'm like, there's a different problem here. If we, if we keep saying the same thing, it's kind of the definition of madness, right? Um, we, we keep expecting a different result. And all that's happened over the past 20 years is there's more of us saying it, <laughs> right? But you start thinking about it and you start realizing that what is going on is we're trying to convince ourselves that we know what the problem is. But if we can't, haven't been able to solve the problem, then can we really say that? And so I started looking at the psychology of it. And I came to B-Sides last year. It was my first B-Sides. I really had a great time. Um, and uh, Melanie Ensign last year, she was, she was talking about how security professionals market themselves, how they market uh, their capabilities and um, how they communicate to executives and all that. And she said, consistently blaming people reinforces the perception of being part of a negative subculture and generates hostility. Well, we all know that because we're kind of a hostile community, right? And in part, we want to generate hostility because we think that by generating hostility, we are going to affect change, right? 
But I'll go back to, we keep saying the same thing over and over. And you can extend that to just about everything else that the community does. W uh, vendors are saying the same things over and over. They're selling the same things over and over. We put new names on them. We do some incremental enhancements. We add about five more pages of configuration and say, now you're good to go, right? So if we keep saying the same thing over and over, and we're developing a negative subculture, so we're being less listened to less and less, then what does that actually mean about us as a community? Now, I piss people off by talking about this in the way that I talk about this. I'm not saying it in order to be adversarial, even though as a security professional, I suppose it is part of my job, right? But I think that we're living with the shared delusion of superiority, right? It's a delusion that is consistently reinforced, right? These headlines, this is from this week because of course I wrote the presentation this week. I didn't really have time to do it otherwise. <laughs> and so um, we, every time we see a data breach, every time we see a hack, every time something happens that's bad in security, it reinforces our rightness, our correctness, right? We are basically living high on the fact that all these years, everything that happens, we are right. And this is proof that we're right. Hmm? Yeah, America, that's right. So, the question at the bottom there, if we're so smart, then why isn't anything getting better? I ask people all the time. I ask um, the uh, people I work with. I, I work with a lot of non-security researchers, right? And I also work with, I'm working with the CISO of my organization right now as he and I have good sit-downs, me having been a CISO, he being a CISO for a, nominally a defense contractor. And I sit down and I say, here are all the ways that I'm breaking your policy right now. You know I'm breaking your policy. You know my team's breaking the policy. And I can tell you all the good reasons why we're breaking that policy. The thing is, is that it's because something's not working. We're not being enabled. We can't do this. But I understand that. I try and serve as a bridge, right? But if we're always consistently right, then why isn't anything getting fixed? So I want to change things up a little bit and say at some point, we need to stop being so good about pointing the finger around everything that surrounds us. And we need to turn the finger back on ourselves as a community. If things aren't getting better, okay, fine. At some point, we just need to come to acceptance. We're living in the state of denial right now. We are the weakest link. The security community has not fixed what we set out to fix. So then the question becomes, okay, after half the room wants to lynch me or, you know, then we go into typical security mode, uh, cynicism. I, I haven't seen anyone leave yet, so I guess I'm doing okay. But the obvious statement, the next statement that we too rarely move towards is what do we do about it, right? What can we do about it? So what I would say from a, psycho from a psychology perspective, and I'm going back to my social psychology um, education where... Of course, the professor asked, why are you in this class? And the best response came from a football player. And yes, MIT does have football players. The best response came from a football player who said, I want to learn how to manipulate people. And the professor says, that's the best response I've ever heard anyone give. <laughs> he also wanted us to grade ourselves by the end of the term. And halfway into it, he was asking us. He had to have an intervention because we were all giving ourselves A's. Um, so I, I presented this theory at ISE Squared last year where I said that my theory is that part of the problem, if we're start, going to start looking at the root causes of the problem, we have to take some introspection, maybe a little bit of intervention. And we have to say that where, what is the root cause of our problem? And I, what, I, what I'm theorizing is that the root cause happened at about the point where the web, was, uh, the web started getting used for e-commerce, right? Where we started professionalizing the use of the internet. And we started to professionalize ourselves as a community, right? At one point in time, hackers and security professionals were the same people in different contexts. In fact, literally the same person, <laughs> right? You were a hacker by some point of the day. You were a protector at some point at night. MIT at the, um, in the 90s, the way that the MIT network was run, the MIT network was run by the hackers. Why? Because they were the ones trying to defend their space 
right, from the hackers that were trying to take over that space. It was a game, you know, it was a game, but we all had very similar skills and we all shared information. We didn't have any sense of malfeasance versus um, uh, what altruism or, you know, whatever you want to call it, goodness. Um, we were the same people, and in a lot of ways, we would make decisions based on the context that gave us kind of that gray hat sort of mentality, right? Depending on the context, we might be a black hat, we might be a white hat. It's all a matter of what we're trying to defend. But then there was a divergence. The divergence happened with professionalizing the use of the internet. Okay, so what happened is we started becoming corporate beings. We, I, we had to start adhering to certain structures. We had to start, um, you know, we, we had to start being consistent. We had to have stability in what we were doing. We had to get certifications. I've had my CISSP forever. I don't know why. It's just kind of inertia at this point, right? <laughs> I don't even know what it means anymore to have it other than the fact that every July I've got to go creeping back through all my, you know, activities to get my CPEs together. Thank you very much, B-Sides, for letting me speak. I think I've got my CPEs for this year. Um, <laughs> hmm? uh, hey, yeah. So, so we, we had this divergence, but the whole puzzle thing up there, we, I, I feel like by professionalizing, we've lost our ability to solve the puzzles we used to solve. We used to get really fascinated by the puzzles, by just trying to tool around and figure out how things worked. And, and we didn't figure out how things broke to find out how they broke. We were, do, we were breaking things trying to figure out how they worked, right? And it was, there, there, was, there was that exploration of it. But what happened is that the security practitioner became way too formal and way too practiced in routine, but the hacker did not. And so there was a divergence and we started losing cycles. We started losing the ability to, to dedicate time, to invest time and resources in doing that stuff. So if you accept that, and I won't ask if anybody accepts that because I like to live in my own delusion of superiority. Uh, what about security is so hard, right? And I ask that question intentionally because one, I, I, I like my hacker graphic of being hit over the head with a hammer, but I ask the question because I feel like we're asking the wrong questions. We're trying to solve the wrong problems. And I think that all the breaches telling us that we're right, that there are problems, it's kind of masking the fact that we're not willing to actually explore what those root cause problems are, right? And so I feel like in all the steps in my career, I, I kept thinking there's gotta be a better way. I'm gonna go try something different. I'm gonna go become an executive and see how operations can be fixed. Okay, well that didn't work out too well. Let me, let me go run a consulting company because I think I, I, I'm better. Well, you know, that didn't work very well. Actually, that worked great. My wife relocated us here and I gave it to my partner because I wasn't willing to travel any, um, down to DC. Well, maybe advanced research had the answer, but then what are some of the things that people say about researchers? And when I say advanced research, I'm talking about, I'm going to be talking about DARPA programs, right? I'm going to sound a lot like Mudge, actually. In fact, you'll see a couple of graphics that look just like Mudge's graphics, except I'm, they're better here. Um, but you, you, from, from, there's got to be a way. All of our intelligence, all of our smartness, and our innate abilities to solve puzzles, we should be able to do a better job. So how do we do that? What about it is so hard? Let's look at that problem. So I know a lot of people have seen this t-shirt walking around the cons. Yeah. Um, Mudge already said this. He, he, he was about as critical of antivirus as I am about the entire security industry as a whole. Security industry is a sub subscribe and respond model. It's not even about security, what we would consider security, right? Um, security companies, they come up, and I can say this because they, they did this to me come up and they say, I want you to subscribe to my service, okay? I want you to subscribe to my service because it's fantastic. Everything you're doing, well, you gotta keep doing it, but I want you to do more. You've got CapEx, right? You've got capital expenditure money. Well, I want you to use it on us because you've gotta use it somewhere. And then when something breaks, I want you to call us again so we can tell you what broke. And then, when we tell you what broke, I want you to call us again because then we'll tell you how to fix it. Oh, you still have CapEx, right? What ended up happening from a CISO perspective is my CapEx stayed level 
year after year, my OPEX was going through the roof because I was kept sliding more and more appliances into my racks, right? But so essentially, the question becomes, why do most of us think this is actually correct? There was a point in time where the only way you learned about data breaches was because Brian Krebs figured it out, going through credit records and you know, dark web forums selling credit cards and you know, all the connections that he has. All these organizations, you know they had the tools, right? They all had tools. And what do we say when Target gets hacked or when Sony gets hacked or whatever? We say, oh, they just weren't using them right. Target, what was the, one of the first headlines I saw? Oh, they had something that could have found the breach, but they weren't using it. It hadn't been actually you know, deployed yet. And we keep finding reasons, but if they have the tools, what good are they? Right? The basic premise I'm trying to get to is an understanding that, OK, we're selling lots of tools, we're using lots of tools, we're consulting, we're integrating, we're doing all this stuff, but they're not working. Our first instinct is to blame the administrators, to blame the users, to blame how it was, conf how it was configured, how it's being logged. Uh, but that's, that's going past the point, right? What we're doing is we're really defeating our core mission, and that's to protect, what's, protect the users, right? How do we protect them if we keep blaming them? So as I delve into this a little more, I kind of came to this idea that we, we sort of, I'm sure people could add to this list, uh, but I kind of started thinking about it from a software perspective. We keep selling tools, generally it's software. There, there's not a lot of hardware, and I'll talk, I might talk about a little bit of that, but I kind of cut it down to three assumptions, right? These three assumptions. We can write secure code, right? You think about the things that we blame people for, right? We can write secure code. We can simplify the administration of software, or uh, simplify the development and administration of software. We can manage patches, right? All of the messages I hear that blame someone kind of go in some spectrum of these assumptions, right? So if we're blaming them based on these assumptions, then these assumptions must be correct, right? Well, if we take a look at each of the assumptions, maybe, maybe, maybe we can get a better understanding of that root cause problem. Um, we can write secure code. Microsoft, our wonderful hosts here, um, hopefully I don't piss anybody off from Microsoft. If I do, I'm sorry. I, I doubt you want to hire me anyway. Um, Microsoft is a great case study, right? The Trusted Computing Initiative, great idea, right? Necessary idea. It was a marketing ploy. It lasted for 10 years, 12 years, something like that. Um, and of course, Microsoft will come back and say, well, it's still going on. All we did is redistribute those people into the places where they need to go. Living one of the mantras that we use, which is the security people need to be integrated into the teams, right? Except what Microsoft doesn't tell you is most of the people who are part of the Trusted Computing Initiative are no longer with Microsoft. So if that was such a good idea, why? Right? Well, we still have Patch Tuesday, right? In fact, the Trusted Computing Initiative, I think, probably started Patch Tuesday because otherwise it was just randomly we were just getting patches. And so in order to help organizations, we, we gave them, okay, here's what we're going to do. Just to make CISO your life easier, we're going to tell you which day of every single week you need to have your people working overtime so they can evaluate whether or not something's going to break in your environment. Right? Then you can plan around it. That's great. Love it. But the core thing is, is that what Microsoft was experimenting with and was doing quite a, let's call it a beneficial effort, was Microsoft really put a lot behind it. I mean, Bill Gates had a great statement about it. I have a lot of respect for everything that um, Mr. Gates has done. And I think this is right, in a way. But yet, here we are, this was what, 2002? Here we are, 14 years later and we're still getting patches every week, right? The, the, the only thing that's changed is that they're shrinking the lifespan of the operating systems, <laughs> so they don't need to keep releasing patches for them, right? My iPad just went in lock. I think Apple needs to fix that. Assumption two, we can, we can simplify software, right? This is gonna look really familiar, okay? Software size continues to grow. 
right? Anybody else see this recently? You know why this chart is better than Mudge's? Well, I'll tell you. Um, I'll tell you. Uh, Mudge's, one of Mudge's bosses who reported to Regina Dugan at DARPA and at Google ATAP was a gentleman by the name of Ken Gabriel, who's now my boss. He hates this chart, too, just as much as General Alexander, I best hate, bet, hates it. And so when I showed him this chart, um, he, he, he said, I hate this chart. And what I did, I took out the years and the lines of code. Now it's gorgeous. Now no one can argue with me about numbers. <laughs> but up there, we have a, I, I changed, I, I've changed some of the, the code bases a little. Mudge talked about operating systems. Uh, I added in, uh, I think that's a C-class Mercedes. Um, uh, Mercedes. Mercedes is great at creating bloatware, I'll tell you what. You should see the number of processors on that thing. It's awesome. <laughs> So anyway, the, uh, Mudge and I have some disagreement as far as the number of bugs per thousand lines of code. I'm pretty sure it's 15. I think that one to five is the number of security defects in a thousand lines of code. But I, I, I don't think we need to argue about that, about numbers. I, I'm actually going to take out those numbers after you know, um, Mudge disagrees because I know, you know Mudge has all the credibility. I'm just some dope up here. Um, so uh, I've got like a, a little um, gallery over here. So, um, so when you take a look at this and you think we can simplify software, this doesn't even tell the whole story, right? Think about the number of packages that we're reusing as we're building software. Think about the number of open source packages. Um, I was just looking at one very commonly used open source package, and it has somewhere on the order of 100 different other packages calling within them. Now, if, you, if you've ever been exposed to, open so uh, to software in general or anything like that, you understand that uh, a package, a software package, may have a lot of functions in it, right? And you need, to, you need to basically use that package in order to call that one function you want, and suddenly you've you know, inherited hundreds of functions you're never going to use, right? And then we're nesting so much into that software that any given developer actually does not, cannot touch every part of the, so, of the software that you're actually delivering. Then when there's a patch that comes out, no one knows where, who's affected by it, right? glibc, that's a good one. Let's have a vulnerability in glibc and see how many people you know, can fix that right away. Um, and so we're talking about all the nesting and everything that happens, and we start to understand that can we really simplify code? I mean, somehow I've heard some people say that the answer is going to be IoT because we're going to have smaller code bases. I laugh. Of course, Mudge already showed that. Malware is not going up anywhere because we only have to attack one little, you know, small part, right? So I, I think that assumption, it, it can be blown away. So third assumption, let's talk about managing patches. Who thinks we can manage a patch? Man we can do patch management. Oh, they just didn't deploy the patch. <laughs> yeah. How many times have you heard people say that? How many times have you said that? How many times have I said that? We are terrible at patching for good and bad reasons, right? OK, the administrator, I can't patch that database because it might break it. Well, yeah, it might. I remember Oracle deployed a patch one time. This was back in the 90s. Oracle de developed a patch for a vulnerability. It was, it was some sort of you know, remote, uh, oh, we've got an open backdoor vulnerability. We're going to close it by not closing the vulnerability, but by removing the function that had it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Oracle. I appreciate Larry. Um, but there are good reasons. There are bad reasons. There are money reasons. There are people reasons, right? But Please don't argue with me about the Verizon DBIR. I intentionally did not fix this to be the 2015 because it seems like nobody likes the 2015. I don't really like the 2015 either. So get past the fact that this comes from Verizon. Let's just focus on um, a little bit about the information. In 2014, Verizon found in its investigations that 75% of, of the vulnerabilities that were exploited in 2014 came from before 2014. In fact, came from 2011 back. I love 1999. I think Verizon, they get a real kick when they put that 1999 in there. You know what that is? That's SNMP. <laughs> it's, 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 it's still a problem, right? It's still a problem, but say, so 75% older than three years, right? 5% were discovered in 2014, or at least disclosed in 2014, right? So 
there's reasons for this. We, we know that, okay, now, now we're looking at it and going, oh my gosh, things are really bad. We can't do anything, right? Well, I think that kind of blows assumption three out of the way, right? Is this right? We could argue over whether or not this is right, but I think it probably is a pretty good point, right? Is the assumption valid? Well, I think based on what I've heard from blame messages, it's a valid assumption that we're making, but is it correct? Can we fix that? There's a harder problem to evaluate here, and it gets worse. Let's talk about IoT again. What, what was it? Um, Nest or Google had bought that uh, hub, and they said uh, that IoT hub that everyone said was going to be the next big thing, and then they killed it and said, what we're going to do is we're just going to remove the capability altogether so that we're not leaving it unmanaged out there. I actually said that was a good idea because that's not what's going to happen, right? Right now, we're getting patches, right? Right now, it's just a process problem, <laughs> right? A really big one. But what about when we stop getting patches? Whose responsibility is it going to be to maintain those devices that are, on, um, that are in the IoT that are no longer being managed by companies that no longer exist? Who? $20,000 in, $20, in appliances, that's right. So that is my premise, the hypothesis. Software will always be inherently flawed. Why do we try to fix that then? You know, we're going, to be, we're going to be trying to write secure code, and what's going to happen is that all of a sudden, we write the best code, and we need to write a new function, and some kid, 22 years old, is going to come in. Some guy who's 60 is finally going to retire. That 22-year-old is going to make a mistake that 60-year-old made when he was 40. Right? Oh, but universities, they're the problem. They're not teaching them right. <laughs> I mean, it, it, Microsoft... I'll, I'll pick on our hosts a little bit. I pick on our hosts a lot. Um, I, Microsoft did a great thing, most brilliant thing they could do in the 90s, and that was to say, hey, we know our software kind of doesn't always work right, but it's not our responsibility to protect it. It's yours. I want you to invest all of your company's money and your employees' time. I want you to create a whole industry, a professional industry, around protecting our software. I call it defect acceptance, right? Brilliant business strategy. You could argue whether or not it's merited, but um, it, it really is. We, we've, we've become accustomed to that idea that it's our jobs to protect something that's already defective, right? But all we can do is just kind of put containers and wrappers around it. But again, I ask, what's the core problem, right? We don't want to ask that because now we're starting to get hard. Right? Our imaginations are starting to run wild about what the problem is. And so what, what I'm trying to charge everyone to do is, number one, stop the blame. It's not effective. It obviously hasn't worked. You know, you could just as easily say stop the madness. Let's start focusing on what the users need to perform well, not where they fail. Right? Let's reassess the problems that we're trying to solve, and let's embrace our inner hackers again. What we're dealing with is we're dealing with a really complex puzzle. And it's a puzzle I think most of us have willingly stopped trying to piece together. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but I'm saying that we, need, we can start forging new paths and stop whining about the problems. We can be part of the solutions. So the question becomes, what are we going to do about it? Well, I put this up here because I, I, I'm really, if you haven't noticed, I'm trying, to charge, I'm trying to charge up the community. I'm trying to change the narrative. Uh, CIO Phonash from um, DHS, he said this in 2016. It's online. You can, you know, it's, it's video. It's, it's really great. He says, there are, there's no, there's a lot of incremental improvements in cybersecurity, but there's really no breakthroughs going on. I'm like, oh my gosh, here's a big, biggest cynic I've heard in a while. Right? The thing is, is he's wrong. But there's a problem. There's a problem. They are happening, and I'm going to talk about three technologies that are going on in Boston right now, or that are being developed in Boston right now. The problem is, is it's, well, one, nobody speaks researcher talk. You know, researchers can't talk to the practitioners because researchers have this idealistic vision. Practitioners want you know, too much, blah, 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 blah. Uh, it's hard to talk to the researchers. I know I do it all every day. Um, but 
the challenge is, is that they don't necessarily have the access the tool or the tools or the relationships to figure out what about what they're doing will work well, right? That's where we as a community can help. We can help the researchers, researchers but it's going to take a little bit of effort. Let me talk about some of the technologies. Appropriate disclaimers, I, I'm, uh, I related to this effort. Uh, one of the things Mudge was talking about is the stuff that DARPA funded. When Mudge was at DARPA, there was one of those big money programs, a $100 million program that was focused on the idea, what if we could redo computer architecture, right? And so that effort was, um, was based on the premise that computer architecture we use today is the exact same computer architecture that von Neumann designed in 1948, 1947, 1948. The same architecture. We just made it bigger, faster, gave it more memory, connected it to a network, and said go. And that architecture is essentially when a processor sees something comes in, it goes, okay. And so what, um, what the project was, it was um, part of the CRASH program, which has some long acronym name that DARPA likes to use, and um, BAE Systems, which I was at. I wasn't involved in this research project, but BAE Systems um, said, uh, had a project around building a secure processor. Now, there are problems with transitioning a secure processor, right? Now you're telling everyone they've got to use a new processor. Well, at the end of the project, the team, the engineering team, was able to demonstrate that they could get most of the same properties that they were building into a proprietary processor onto a commodity processor. And so um, we call it Dover. Draper took over the transition of it. Draper is a not-for-profit research laboratory. And um, uh, the reason why I came was you know, to do this, but the reason why I went over to Draper is because it's board-driven, mission-oriented, and they said, we are going to invest money we have in the bank to see if we can transition that. That's one of the gap areas. DARPA is going to fund a project from 80% risk, say, to about maybe, let's say, 60 or 50% risk. A VC is only going to fund something at sub-20% risk. So where's the 30% going to come from? That's what Draper is trying to do. They're giving us the opportunity to do that. We may crash and burn, but one of the things that's really cool is we've, we stopped Heartbleed. Uh, we dem demonstrated that to our CEO in February. We stopped Heartbleed on the working, we're working on an FPGA right now, so bare metal FPGA. So we, we showed Heartbleed working. It, it, gave, it gave his password, actually, so we know Ken Gabriel's password. Um, but then um, what we did is we, we put it on our adapted processor, and it stopped it. The cool thing about it is it's on a RISC-V. RISC-V, if anybody's not familiar with RISC-V, RISC-V is an open source instruction set architecture being developed out of, it's essentially out of Berkeley. It's backed by Google. It's backed by um, uh, um, Oracle. It's backed by Amazon and several others. Uh, the point here isn't to tout our own technology. It's to, it's, it's to talk about, this is really cool. If we succeed, this is awesome, right? Nobody uses RISC-V today, but the thing is, is it's open. You know how much ARM costs? ARM costs a million dollars a year to use for companies to use $20 million to design to. The, what we would need to do is we would need to be doing $20 million to, to do what we feel needs to be done at the processor level per year to do it on ARM. We started with RISC-V because eh, it's free. <laughs> you know, it's open source. Um, but it's an example. It's an example, and we, we're forming a, a not-for-profit collaboration with industry partners right now to get access to it, to see how, is it, how could it work in your environment. And we're going to open source all of the tools that are necessary to do it. So great example. Uh, I, I have a link up here. Oh, yeah, credit to Randall Monroe, XKCD rocks. Um, uh, that link on the slides, I'll make the slides available somehow. You can always um, email me too. Uh, that link will take you to the core paper, one of the core papers that describe the technology from the research perspective. Another technology, uh, not affiliated with this, well, I kind of, one of the projects I manage, MIT is a team member for DARPA. They're doing a competing project on the same. So I'm not talking about my project, I'm talking about MIT's project because it's really cool and I'm an MIT grad, so I try and pump them up a little bit. Um, <laughs> the idea of profit is auto-correcting code as you're, as you're working on it. How cool would that be? Um, they're, they're not quite to auto-correcting right now, but they are doing synthesis for a specific code class, but 
they've got about two and a half more years of work to do on the project. But this is really great technology. It's the idea they, they can, uh, press office said recently that um, uh, they can repair 10 times as fast as other, um, as other techniques. They also do different things than other techniques do. But this is being done right, where are we? It's right there. <laughs> you know, at the, at the strange Frank Gehry Design Status Center over there. That's where this work is going on. They would love, they would love to get real problems from practitioners that they can focus some attention on in solving, right? You can just contact the researchers. I, I put a link to the place where they talk about um, profit for your information. There's a paper there. Also, all the contacts are there. And then let me talk about IBR. Uh, I came from BAE Systems when I came over to Draper, uh, Draper, Draper. Um, and I've used IBR. I've designed technologies on top of IBR. Disclaimers there. I think it's really, really cool. And it's open source, so it's available right now online. And what IBR, what's really cool about IBR, introduction-based routing, it's based on this concept that two endpoints cannot communicate unless introduced by a third party, by, a, by, by some communal third party. That third party can then be connected to other third parties in order to create a link chain of introduction. Then, if one of the endpoints detects something wrong with something going on with the other endpoint, the reputation is funneled through all the introducers. And eventually, if your reputation drops to some level, then you would take action on that. It was, it's, it's a very simple technology. It uses point-to-point uh, -point VPNs. Once the introduction chain goes through, then what happens is it creates a point-to-point -point tunnel between the two uh, endpoints. Uh, that tunnel is refreshed in some arbitrary time frame. We were generally doing three minutes. There was, uh, we demonstrated how it had no effect on a video stream, for example, between two endpoints as it was refreshing that session. And what it does at that session refresh, it is it asks everyone in the chain, have you heard anything bad? Have you heard anything bad? Have you heard anything bad? Um, really, really simple concept. The researcher who first came up with the idea, a gentleman by the name of Greg Frazier, he runs his own company down in Virginia. Uh, he called it a peer-to-peer -peer network for devices. What we had done at BAE, the technology, we actually ended up building a management layer around it uh, for cyber physical systems. And um, after I left BAE, they continued with it. And it seems to have some, um, some movement in DOD. So we'll, we'll see how the technology evolves. But like I said, it's open source. You can play around with it now, right? And um, there's a pay I put a link to up there for the core introductory paper again. Uh, one of the things I, I was impressed by, um, Josh Corman said at a recent a conference last year, he said at a presentation where somebody was talking about active research going on, technology research, he said there isn't enough of this going on on security cons. So that's why I'm putting the paper sources. This is stuff you can actually get access to, you can look at, you can find the contacts, you can talk to people about them. Okay? So, no breakthroughs going on. Each of these technologies solves lower level problems than we've been willing to um, address up to this point. Are they the solutions for those problems? Well, time's going to tell. But to say that it's not happening, that there aren't people exploring this space, is just flat out wrong. My tagline, solutions, not problems. We've blamed people enough. But our jobs are to protect the users, maybe to protect them from themselves, right? But the thing is, is that they're are inherent flaws in everything that we use today. And we have been unwilling to address those flaws, thinking that either the problem is too hard or that they're impossible to fix. I don't believe either of those are the case, but I don't believe we're trying hard enough. But I think the researchers have the right ideas. I think DARPA, to Mudge's point, I think DARPA is doing a great job of seeding this stuff. But they need help. The researchers need help. So I, I said um, the definition of madness. I, when I pitched this speech, I talked about Moby Dick, Ahab and Moby Dick, right? Um, I, I get the sense that we as a community are really turning to Ahab and we're chasing our white whale. It's imaginary, the problems that we're trying to solve. Right? They're not really the problems. They're just the easy way for us to reinforce 
our feeling of superiority. So what can we do about it? How do we change? Every security practitioner can help in some way, if you're willing. Number one, collaborate. Reach out to the researchers. Find out about these technologies that are, going, that are happening. S sit down with some of these researchers. Granted, some of them are arrogant pricks. I, I, I work with many of them. Um, I, I think in order to do stuff that they're doing, you kind of have to be, but they would love to hear your insight. And I'm sure you would appreciate understanding how they're approaching the problem. I mentioned before, Draper is starting to host an industry-wide collaboration around the concept of inherent security. It's not meant to sell our processor. Like I said, we're open sourcing you know, most of the tools. So there are some designs that may end up getting classified, yada, yada, yada. But, there, but we're, having, we're hosting this collaboration in order to bring organizations together to say, okay, if we agree that there's a big problem and we agree we can be part of the solution, how do we build an ecosystem to start supporting that solution space? Right? So reach out, evaluate. One of the things that I found when I was in my CISO position is I didn't give any time for my employees to just tool around. Right? I didn't give them any sort of new directions. Hey, this is a problem area, right? Can you go explore this? I might say, hey, this vendor called me and wants to sell me this tool. Can you go evaluate it? That's not, a, that's not research. That's not research. Um, reserve time to take a look at this stuff. Give your employees a way to do it. I, I mentioned, B-Sides asked, what, what do we want to um, say, what questions do we want to ask at the CSO panel? And one of the questions I want to ask is, what are you willing to allow your employees to do to help your organization get more protected, right? And I'm not talking just internal bug bounties or something like that. I'm talking about, are you going to give them time to tool, right? To kind of re-engage that inner hacker and participate. Offer researchers time and resources to help. I'll tell you, um, from my perspective, I'm working on a project right now where if I could get object code from companies, if I could just get your object code and I could, you just allowed me to store it, for example, right? So I can use it for my evaluation. For I'm, we're doing a machine learning, uh, Macy had mentioned it, machine learning against um, to predict bugs in code, right? We're gonna find something at some point and we can talk to you about it. But we're not looking for any of your time to do it other than if you give us your code, if you're willing to, right? Um, you can give us old code if you want, I don't care. Uh, just something to help us do it, right? In some cases, what I've been doing is I've been reaching out also to other organizations, uh, commercial organizations, and saying, hey, do you want to participate in some DARPA research? Are you willing to do that? I mean, Google, you have lots and lots of money. Can you spare, you know, 100 engineers to help us out on this project? Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, but we don't need necessarily a lot. We just need a starting point. And so what I'm just asking the community to do is give it a little thought. Offer something of yourself. Kind of get to that hacker mentality again and start asking, well, is there something else that I could be doing with a little bit of time, a little bit of money, a little bit of resource? That could be an and, it could be an or. <laughs> so that's my pitch. It is now 2.47. I'm two minutes over. I apologize for that. Um, are there any questions? No problem. Any questions? From the peanut gallery over here. Uh, all right, Thomas. So I work for the uh, 501 as research and development in industry, and one of the biggest challenges is getting people to share their proprietary information. Even this deprecated, they have some new compliance requirements which protects that information from being shared mm -hmm. or research even. How do you guys overcome that? Well, part of I, I think um, I think part of the thing is there there needs to be an educational side, you know, informational, right? Because there are lots of agreements that are preventing that. I, I work in the Department of Defense space, and I try getting code from defense projects, even though, I mean, please, I've got a SCIF available to me. I could keep things classified. I, I you know, can, can we just, and there's that need to know sort of thing, and it's the same problem. And I was talking to um, one of the, 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 gosh, I forget her name at the moment, the, the person who runs the bug bounty program for the, the Hack the Pentagon, right? I was talking to her. Hmm? Well, no, for, uh, on the DOD side. 
And um, I talked to her a week and a half ago, and I asked her a very similar question. And she said part of it is the educational side, the informational side. It's, it's making it available. But part of it is also helping them understand that just because um, it's going out doesn't make it any less, it doesn't make it any more available to attackers than it already is. And so when you, um, if you have those agreements, it's one thing. There are technologies where the researchers can bring it to your organization and you could use it there, perhaps. Um, you can also, of course, I think as far as agreements are concerned, if you go through the chain of people who are responsible for the restriction, that you can architect some sort of way in order to do it. It's not an easy problem from a contractual perspective, but my whole thing is I'd much rather go to the source than to go to some, you know, further up the chain interface as, as concern. So I'm not saying it's, it's certainly easy, but um, it'll get easier if more people start allowing it. And part of it is a trust thing, right? I mean, I can't tell you that Draper is going to hold your code and no one's going to get access to it, right? Um, but then again, neither can you. <laughs> so, so there, there's, there's some perception things to go over and stuff. Um, I, I think there are strategies to be able to, to do it. And I've worked on the contractual side of getting through some of those strategies. And there are ways. Yeah, uh, oh, I guess she's, she's in control. Uh, we have a question right here. Hi, thanks. Uh, so you mentioned a couple of times Yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose I probably implied a few ways of how um, you need to support the users, but um, what, one of the things is, is that our way of providing features to users is um, completely, um, it's way too complex. Right? We just add configurations to tools that we're developing, and we expect that as long as the capability is made available, then the user can use it. But we have no attention to usability. You know, what is it that users can actually do? I don't think there's enough user testing about, about the tools that are actually going into place. That's, that's one example, and of course, I'm biased because I started my career in IT as a usability engineer. Uh, another way is simply by... Um, blaming them when something goes wrong. I mean, how many times have you heard people be blamed because they used a bad password rather than say, well, the whole act of using passwords is wrong. You know, or the way we apply, the way we use passwords is absolutely wrong. We have websites today that won't let you copy and paste a password into the input field because they say that's a security risk, but that prevents anyone using a password vault from being able to use their secure passwords. <laughs> Right, um, so I think that there's that secure by design sort of sort of perspective. We need to kind of apply that to the community itself and understand that secure by design means designing user interactions in such a way that prevents them or helps them not break the security chain. Um, we're more informed than they are about the risks, and yet we put all the tools for them to protect themselves in their hands. Okay. Um, and in looking at the ways that kind of socio-technical and cultural factors matter to thinking about making large complex systems safe. Mm -hmm. um, have you looked at any of that in terms of ways of helping users or ways of making systems kind of more efficient? I haven't looked at um, ways in, in that regard. Of course, you know, I'm one person. I'm focused on some sort of limited problem spaces, right? I'm familiar with some of the work, and um, uh, again, I think it's really, really cool work. There are challenges when it comes to the vast major a vast number of systems that we're going to start, or devices that we're going to start um, talking about and stuff. So I think that it's, it's a great example of approaches that are being applied to address these problems. But like I said, I, I don't have direct exposure in it. Um, one of the things, I think there aren't enough people looking at things the way, uh, trying to bridge the gaps the way that um, a few of us are. 
but I think that many of us are capable of doing it. So it's great to hear about that. And I think one of the big challenges comes in disclosure, right? In talking about this stuff, right? An academic researcher isn't going to come to B-sides and talk about their work, right? And, and well, they, they, they may not be able to in many, many regards. Academic researchers generally don't care what they're allowed to do. But um, <laughs> um, I think then once you start transitioning something, you end up going into some sort of stealth mode where you don't want to talk about it, right? So, so there, there is a disclosure challenge there as well. I think where we don't, when we don't have any issues with disclosure, like with these technologies, everything I set up here is all public sourced information, right? There are things I can't talk about, obviously, in this audience, but that's all public sourced information, and I'm willing to, you know, I want to do it because I think that there's a lot going on that we should be talking about, and I'm just trying to put some more focus on having people talk about that side of how they're trying to fix that technology research side. I think we have time for one more Uh, I, you know, it's, <laughs> from my background, I talk about the gap areas <laughs> when I'm with my um, folks. Uh, we talk about it. We, um, the, uh, I generally become the voice. <laughs> I become the voice for the user, the voice for the human. Uh, uh, but funny enough, uh, our lab at the moment is co-located with our human factors folks <laughs> um, in, uh, at Draper. So uh, we... Um, uh, so, and I kind of take it in a different direction. I've been working with the human factors folks on identifying a new solution space where we can combine security and the human factors stuff in order to do some really interesting things around, um, I don't want to say too much, around how we can model attacks uh, and how attacks work, right? And uh, so I think there are probably two sides of it. There's the how do we leverage that information to understand how users are using the tools that are available to them. And I think we need to do more of that from a practitioner perspective. Then there's the research perspective. How can we leverage the research that how they, how the research they've already done in behavior analysis and uh, usage analysis and all that stuff. How can we leverage that to understand better how systems work for the user? And, um, and how systems work for the attackers. <laughs> and so I, 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 there, there are some really, we've been tossing around some really interesting ideas and um, we've been pitching some of them to DARPA and we're, we're, we're hitting a little bit of success, a little bit of failure. And so I think I always say messaging, usually when I, get a, when I fail at doing something, it's because I didn't communicate it well enough. And so we're working on our messaging right now to help at least communicate our ideas better. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.